Awesome. All right. Well, it's 1015. I'm going to get rolling. So hopefully we can get through all of this. If you've been to one of my trainings before, you'll know I get distracted and off topic and we have a lot of fun and I don't finish the things that I'm supposed to share with you. So we're going to try not to do that today. We're going to do our very best. So my name is Zara Wiley. I'm the director of urban ecology and the restoration ecologist for the Sacramento Tree Foundation. Uh, running tech and answering your frantic phone calls is my sidekick, Chow Vu. Thank you so much for doing that for us today. Um, I would not be able to do this by myself. Uh, like many things to, uh, these days, um, anything that you used to be able to do with one person now takes four. So um, I'm super grateful to him and uh, Stephanie, our communications and engagement manager and everyone at the Tree Foundation that's helped make sure that we could get online and communicate at least virtually with everyone today. So thanks for being here. Um, a really quick appreciation. I am in a beautiful, beautiful park in Rockland at the moment. Um, I want to give an appreciation for the Nisanon people who are the, um, um, this is their ancestral home. And if you do get out here to look at the trees that I'm looking at today or to learn more, which I, I recommend, this is a great park to see um, our three most common local oak species all in one place. There's actually a, a mortar rock out here too, and I'll show you where a little bit later. So um, much appreciation for this land that we're on and for these oak trees and the fact that they're here. So next slide, please, Chow. All right. Uh, for those of you that missed Wednesday, just a quick little background. Uh, I am a member of the Sacramento Tree Foundation. This is uh, my employer and the mission that I get to work for. Um, we are an urban forestry focused nonprofit organization. Um, and our mission is to grow thriving communities through urban forestry. So that covers a lot of different things. We have a really wide variety of programs. We're actually pretty diverse for a nonprofit. And we have been around um, since 1980. So we have really deep roots. Haha, <laughs> it's my first tree joke. I'll be making some nut jokes too, I'm sure, um, here in the Sacramento region. Um, so thank you for all of you that are also members of the Sacramento Tree Foundation and for being here today. And if you have questions about how to get free shade trees or the Elm Project or uh, our urban wood rescue program or any of the other things that we're doing, go ahead and throw that in chat and um, either Chow and I will send you the right contact information to get you any and all information that you would need. Um, just in general, I'll say it's a tough time for nonprofits right now. And so we appreciate that you're here online with us and that you've been supporting us. It means a lot. All right, next slide, please. I'm glad there's slides. It helps keep me on track a little bit. So here, here's what we're going to cover. Um, as you can see, I, I'm live because I'm hoping to actually really get at least my hands on tree materials and show them to you as closely as possible today. Um, because how to identify oak trees, this is kind of an intimidating thing. Um, it is difficult. Um, it's okay that you are, may not be good at it, and I don't want you to um, worry about that. It's, um, it's really an exposure thing. So um, you need to be exposed to it a lot, and you need to look at a lot of trees before you can say, oh, okay, I know that is a blah. Because the thing is that trees, much like people, are very unique and individual, and they have different um, characteristics. They grow in different places. They have different histories and backgrounds. So they don't look the same, even if we have decided that they're within a group. So we're going to talk about how to identify oaks. Uh, we're going to talk about how to harvest acorns um, in an environmentally responsible way and an ethical way and to be part of this program. And then we're going to talk about how we are going to work together even though we are apart. So that's, that's the sum of this one. And yes, this is the second part of our acorn harvester training. Um, we do ask and it's a requirement of our permits to harvest that you are a trained acorn harvester. So thanks for being here and we'll get you caught up um, if you're behind. It is, it's our goal to have everyone who wants to participate in some way be able to participate. All right, let's do the next one. Thanks, Chow. Weird to not control my own, um, my own, yeah. And I know everyone's laughing because they know how much I like to be in charge of stuff. Okay, so we're gonna start with part one, how to identify oaks. And if you, I, I don't know if you are at your house and you have a tree in your yard that you think might be an oak tree, you're welcome to take just a moment and run out and grab a couple leaves or later when you take a break. I highly recommend it. If nothing else, please later today take a walk and see if you can identify oaks or not. That will be a great follow-up for today. All right, next slide, please. 
Oh my gosh, where to start? Okay, trees, trees are big and green, right? It's totally okay if that is where you are. Um, welcome, <laughs> welcome to tree nerd land. I'm gonna tell you there's lots of trees that I cannot identify. Um, I am constantly surprised by things that I find. And so I think what's more important than like immediately knowing every species of tree is two different things, right? To know, to know enough to say, you know, I don't know, maybe I should figure it out. And to also have a basic start to get you a little closer to where you're going. So for this project, we're mostly concerned about identifying if a tree is an oak tree or not. So let's do that, right? Okay. So the top row here, we're gonna start um, that lovely Christmas tree. It's really good to look at tree shape, right? It's really easy to see a Christmas tree shaped tree. And you can say very easily, this is not an oak tree. <laughs> oak trees do not have Christmas tree shape unless you've pruned them in really horrifying ways. So below that on the bottom is a very, very stately large, one of my very favorite, most wonderful trees in the world. It is in Folsom, California. Um, I call it grandmother oak because she's clearly been there a very long time and has um, a very large wide canopy and also is very tall. Um, you'll know if you go visit this tree now, she doesn't look like this anymore because also like a classic valley oak, she's dropped some of these side limbs. And so she now has kind of a funky structure. Um, so the top one, the Christmas tree, if it looks like a Christmas tree, it is not an oak tree. Um, and if it has a more broadleaf tree, more rounded canopy shape, could be an oak tree. So let's move to that middle picture. Hey, it's got needles. Look at those, like on a Christmas tree. Um, if your tree has needles and it doesn't have some sort of broad leaf, like you see on the bottom there, that's actually a, a black oak or Quercus calogii leaf. Um, it is not an oak tree. Now there's some funny trees with needles that are called things like river she oaks um, or what's the other one? It's like a silver oak. Those are not oak trees. There's lots of things that have the name oak in their name, like poison oak, that are not actually oak trees. So if it's got needles, even if it's called an oak tree, it is not. So you cannot worry about it. We're looking for things that have these broad leaves, not needles, or there's also scales on like cypress trees. Those are not oak trees. Um, however, um, oak trees can be either evergreen or deciduous. So that is not something that can help you. So um, just know that. And then this third one, because we're going for really simple and I want you to do this later as you're just walking around, even if you only get to this level, does it look like a Christmas tree? No, okay, might be an oak tree. Does it have needles? No, could be an oak tree. This third one at the very top, you see these pretty pink flowers and this funny green fruit. If it has flowers or fruit that look like your standard flowers or fruit, it is not an oak tree. Because as we know, the fruit of a um, oak tree is the acorn. And um, you can see in this bottom picture, I have a really giant acorn that's from a Baroque um, Quercus macrocarpa. And then I have a teeny, teeny, tiny little, um, little acorn from, I think it's just from one of the like Texas gray oaks. Um, I took this picture in the UC Davis Arboretum. If you wanna see the entire variety and range, uh, well, not the entire, cause there's 600 species of oaks worldwide, but a pretty good variety of acorns, please go to the UC Davis Arboretum sometime in the next month and check it out. Um, they're having a good acorn year and there's lots of stuff. Meredith, you probably have a fun time with your kiddos. It's a great place for kids. They have a lot of um, art and science that they've mixed in to their displays there. Um, I don't recommend the weekend, it's super busy, but if you can get out there during the week, it's really fantastic. So they didn't pay me to say that, but um, it really, really is. So if you can get these three things done today, to figure out if it's an oak tree, you will be well on your way to being a tree nerd. It doesn't look like a Christmas tree, it doesn't have needles, and it doesn't have any other kind of flowers or fruit. If it has an acorn, it's an oak tree. All right, oh, I'm gonna look at Q&A real quick. Um, see if there's anything scale. Oh, Janice is asking what are scales on a tree. So um, they're kind of a modified needle. Um, I'm trying to, like if you've seen like a cypress tree or even like the cypress bushes that you often have in your awesome 1970s landscaping in front of your house. Um, it's, it's a modified leaf that is like compressed and almost flat. So it almost looks like if you, if you were to like brush it back from the, the tip of your, your stem that has this, they would like poke you a lot. Um, I don't think there's any in this park that I'm in, but um, yeah, if you wanna look up like the cypress family, 
is known for having scales instead of needles or your regular standard leaf. Great question. All right, Chow, let's see what's next. Ah, okay, here I am. We're bringing it back to what we are talking about. So on Wednesday, we talked about the approximately 20 species of oaks in California. And we went, you know, we actually don't have to learn all 20 because they aren't all here. I mean, they, they might be all here planted in landscaping, but we're really worried about for our project, um, our natural spaces. So there's really five that we are concerned about harvesting from for our project. And if you narrow that down even a little bit more to those of us who live on the valley floor, so I'm talking about no one higher in elevation than like Cameron Park and um, on the west side, um, you know, not going up into the foothills like towards Lake Berryessa, which is not a good place to go to try and harvest right now anyways. Um, we only have three. So the three species that we are going to learn today that are our main focus today and are in general the main focus of our um, project are the, uh, um, the California blue oak, Quercus douglasii, um, valley oak, Quercus lobata, and the interior live oak, or Quercus wislizeni. And I'm sorry about the wind. I'm hoping that um, it doesn't get too noisy and I don't sound awful because of the wind. Uh, that was the one thing I was really worried about today. And um, we're definitely talking about the next tech purchase for our organization to be a decent microphone so we can be outside in all weather and communicate virtually with people without it being horribly noisy. So if it gets really awful and you can't hear, um, let me know and I'll see if we can't mess with the sound a little bit. All right, so those are the three we're gonna focus on. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Let's start, let's just start, let's do it. All right, see this is why I made slides. So this is a great time to learn oak trees. And one of the reasons why is because it's fall and it's acorn season. And the acorns are one of the most distinct features of the oak trees. So if you have a standard oak that meets, you know, that fits really well within its, its species criteria, the acorn will help you know that. And so it's a really good time to start learning them and learning some of their idiosyncrasies. Because if you have a standard fruit, they're like, yeah, this is clearly a valley oak acorn and the leaf matches, you have a valley oak tree, which is great. So um, starting from, I don't know if your screen's the same as mine. So starting from the, the two hands with green acorns in them. So these are our blue oak acorns, Quercus douglasii. If you remember from Wednesday, it's important to always also know what section you're oak in. So that's, these are in the Quercus section of Quercus in the genus Quercus, yeah. Good stuff. So this is Quercus douglasii. And so the acorns, I, I these are kind of some of my favorite to have in my pocket because they're, they're kind of, they're a little bit chunky. Um, they're not pointy like the valley oak acorns. And they also, they have this waxy coating on them that is really interesting. And we'll look at that a little bit later when I get some fresh ones, because luckily I'm here where there's oak trees and there's fresh acorns. Um, and then you can see in the bottom picture where it's attached to the tree, it's not very, it looks like it's not all the way in that cap. I always call the, the cap of Quercus douglasii, the blue oak. Um, it looks like a little beret. Um, so that's a great way to say, yeah, this is a blue oak. It's got this not very pointy, chunky acorn. It's kind of waxy and a little beret hat. It's a blue oak, Quercus douglasii. Um, we'll hop to the middle with these lovely tiger stripe acorns. So I'm not gonna be able to show you these acorns today because they're not, these are ripe. When they're fully ripe, they're this beautiful orange color with stripes. Um, we'll see some immature acorns on the tree today, but they're not all the way ripe yet. So it looks more like the picture on the bottom. This is the interior live oak, Quercus wislizeni. And um, you can see all acorns when they're immature green. Um, they all do change colors and get darker when they get all the way um, mature. But just because they're still green doesn't mean they're not ripe. When they're ripe, they come off the tree. So that's, it's, it's really helpful. <laughs> they, they pop out of their caps or dehiss from their acorn caps when they're ripe, which is great. That makes it easy for us to know when they're ready. Um, so back to the middle again. Once again, this is Quercus wislizeni, the interior live oak. And um, we'll look at this a little bit later. This is an evergreen oak and um, it is in a different section. However, this is in the Lobite section of Quercus within Quercus. 
All right, all the way over to the far side, these luscious, large, dark brown acorns. This is the valley oak, Corycus lobata. Um, this is the main species that we are interested in harvesting for, for our project, because um, this is what uh, most, most of what we need for reforestation projects. Um, our, most of the work that we have scheduled for the next two years is uh, really focused on the valley floor, and that is where uh, Corcus lobata thrives. Um, and also Quercus lobata, it has been the most um, decimated as far as the oak populations in the greater Sacramento Valley over the last 300 years. Um, it really likes to grow on prime farmland. And so um, us people have decided that um, we'd, we'd rather use that land for farming. Also they're big chunky trees that um, were used to fuel the steam engines um, early on if you needed a lot of fuel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was a, a great, you could get a whole lot by cutting down a giant oak tree pretty quick. Um, so more than 95% uh, of our, our riparian forests in California have been um, eliminated. And um, because of that, this is the main one that we're going to be um, collecting. And we've got something going on here. I'm going to hold on a sec, everyone. We have Chow gave his like you gave um, Chow, you're the host. Um, we have a new attendee that you gave them your sign in. Go ahead and demote them to a, um, a, a participant so that we don't have any sound issues, please. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Yeah, don't worry. Um, Chow is gonna he's gonna um, demote you to an attendee. So <laughs> yeah, mute's also good. Thank you for that, and welcome. Thanks, Chow. It's great. We're all learning how to use this technology, and sometimes it doesn't go perfectly, does it? <laughs> all right, perfect. Thanks. We're, we're rolling again. So um, Valley Oak, Quercus lobata, it's on the right side with these very large pointy acorns. And we're going to go deeper and actually get to meet these trees. So let me pull up Q&A really quick. Um, so do the blue oak acorns turn dark? Yeah, I'll show you that a little bit um, later. And um, on the slide, we have um, the, the hands with green acorns is blue oak, Quercus douglasii. The ones in the middle are the interior live oak, Quercus wislizeni. And then the dark acorns and the picture of branches on my right, I, I hope it's your side, is uh, Quercus lobata or the valley oak. Um, there's a question about do oak trees still have acorns when they get really old? Um, and the answer is yes, um, but they do seem to slow down a little bit. I mean, I haven't been around for 100 years, so I can't tell you on a specific tree how its, its crop has changed in the last 100 years. Um, th there's not great information on this, mostly because the life scale of oak trees, um, you know, valley oaks can live easily three to 500 years. Um, the blue oaks, they, there's been some in Sacramento that have come down that have been aged at, you know, 1100, 1200 years old. Uh, we're not around long enough and we don't sit and watch them and take good enough notes to actually know exactly how that works. So it would be nice if somebody wanted to start a project and maybe in 1100 years let us know how the acorn cycles differ in an old blue oak. But I don't think it's going to happen because um, unfortunately there's not a huge like economic interest in our oak trees. So there's not necessarily the kind of research we'd want to know. However, anecdotally, I have been harvesting acorns here in the Sacramento region for 15 years. And I can tell you a couple of things that seem to be true. I mean, I have like a journal, I have notes, but I haven't, um, I haven't taken a lot of data that is scientifically rigorous because that's not my background or what I do. <laughs> Although sometimes I think it would be fun. And some things I've noticed is that um, acorn years are variable. A good acorn year like this, this is a pretty good acorn year. A lot of trees have acorns. I wouldn't call it a mast year, which is a year when every, not every tree, but is an, a, a noticeably huge production of acorns. It's not a mast year. I've seen years much, much, much more prolific than this. Um, and we've also had years where it's been very, very, very challenging to find any acorns at all. So it's very cyclical and it does depend on the tree. I have some very reliable tree friends that seem to produce acorns no matter what's going on in the world. And um, I appreciate them and give them lots of hugs when I go to see them and harvest their acorns. Um, and we can go down a rabbit hole on that. So I'm not gonna do it right now. Um, 
And then there's some trees that don't seem to produce at all. I would say that the medium age trees are the ones that uh, have been reliable for me for 15 years. It's not the really, really old ones. And the young trees, it seems like it takes eight to 15 years for an oak tree to actually produce acorns. Now, um, the literature says seven years is, is standard for oaks and I would buy that, but I, it seems like it's even longer and it is species dependent. Um, and also you can't like really necessarily des decide that a small tree is, is young. There's little blue oak trees out here in this forest where I'm at in Rockland today that are, that are maybe only eight feet tall, but they could easily be 50, 60, 70 years old. They don't grow very fast, so. All right, oh, I'm gonna look at Q&A one more time, but um, I'm really, really good at getting off topic. Uh, I'm gonna answer your questions later, Eric. Trying to distract me, I see what you're up to. I appreciate it. All right, let's go to the next one. Ciao. I believe it's time to actually look at a couple trees. It's getting a little, oh, not quite acorn features. I was just talking about this. This is why we make um, presentations so we don't get lost. So um, I said that acorns are a great way to identify your oak tree, and that is true. And here are some features that I want you to just look for today and really focus on. And there's basically the main thing to look for to start out is look at the acorn cap. You'll notice in this picture that the valley oak, Quercus labata, and the blue oak, Quercus douglasii, they both have these bumpy scaly caps that look somewhat similar. That's because they're related. They're, you know, in the same group. They're both in the section Quercus. Um, and then over on the left, we have an interior live oak. And then the bottom picture that's not part of it is um, uh, a black oak, Quercus uh, cologii. They have these feathery scaly caps because they're in the section Lobatae. And then in the middle, you guys might see I have an Oracle Oak acorn. I'm super proud of myself for, for having one one year to take this picture. Um, if you came on Wednesday and we talked about hybrids, the Oracle Oak, uh, Quercus X Morejas, whenever you see an X in the middle of a Latin binomial like that, it means that there's two, there's two different species of the parents of that tree. Um, you can see it's got the feathery cap. And then if you look actually at the nut, I don't know if the resolution's good enough on the picture, you can see that the nut is fuzzy. And that's because that tree has the interior live oak, Quercus wislizeni, and the black oak, Quercus cologia, is its parent. And the acorn itself shows features of both parents as kind of intermediate. Um, and the same goes for the picture of the leaves and acorn I have underneath the blue oak, Quercus uh, deliaceae, and the valley oak, Quercus lobata. That is of an oracle oak. And it's the same thing. There's this acorn that is like, it kind of looks like both a blue oak and a valley oak. How can that be? Huh, it's because it's actually a hybrid tree. And I'm hoping that later today I can actually go show you that tree because it's here in this park and it's one of my favorites. All right, one more slide please, Chow. Can you tell I'm anxious to actually touch trees? Yes, let's touch trees. So um, let's start with Quercus labata. Um, my intent today is we're gonna go through the species and this presentation. And then with whatever time I have left, I'm gonna take you on a hike around the park and we're gonna look at as many different individual trees as possible. So you can see some of the wide variation that occurs within a single species of tree. So we're gonna start with valley oak. Um, this is the monarch of our forest. I'm standing under one right now. It's getting a little windy and I'm having acorns almost hit me, which is amazing and wonderful. And uh, these trees tend to grow in the best soils here in the valley. Uh, they can get really tall and really wide. And um, one of the things that I like about them, I'm gonna actually take you, turn you around a little bit. If people don't prune them, and yeah, gonna take a minute, sometimes it takes a minute to get the resolution. If people don't prune them, their branches will reach the ground like this. So you end up kind of in this little like canopy forest, um, which is lovely. In urban settings, they always get pruned. And so this pretty much will never happen because people like to have their sight lines and clearance, unfortunately. So let's get a little closer. Like I said, it might take a minute for it to be less fuzzy. We're just gonna do our best. And actually, Chow, can you close that so we can get full screen on the, um, full screen on me so that people can see as good as possible. Just go ahead and pause the presentation. 
and hopefully I should be now the big voice on your computer screen. So I'm going to look at, Quirk, at this valley oak Quercus lobata again and how the branches are touching and scraping the ground. They actually kind of clear it a little bit, which makes it a lot easier to harvest acorns if you're in an open grassland setting like this. Um, some other denizens of under uh, Quercus lobata is often poison oak or lots of prickly shrubs. So it's really nice to find a spot like this where it'll actually be easier to pick up the acorns because please don't get lots of poison oak for this project, it's not worth it. All right, I'm gonna get a little closer. The wind is gonna make this really hard. I'm, I, yeah, I tried to ask the wind to hold off, but we'll do our best. So some things to notice right away are these leaves, that they're lobed. That means that they, they have these cuts into them. And valley oak, if you can get one leaf that exemplifies this really good. Um, valley oak, get it in the sun for you guys. So the lobe on the leaf, it actually has a secondary little lobe right here on the end of the lobe. It's double lobed. That's why we call it Quercus lobata. It's super lobey. So that is the main thing to look for. And you'll see that there's a lot of different leaf sizes and shapes. And so you wanna look at more than one leaf whenever you're trying to identify a tree. If you look at just one leaf, um, it can be pretty confusing because they can be really variable. Um, leaf size can really depend on features such as how much water the tree is getting, um, how much sunlight that leaf is getting. So um, it can make the whole, can be very, very variable. So here's an acorn. Let me get it in the sun for you. If you know anyone who's a professional camera person who wants to do this stuff with us, please reach out. All right, so here's a very classic valley oak acorn. It has this warty cap, it's bumpy, and you can see this one's green, pointy. Um, if you can give them a squeeze, kind of like if you've picked raspberries, you know they pop right off when they're ripe. I'm giving this one a squeeze right below the acorn cap, it's not coming off. This acorn is not ripe yet. Now it's true to some extent that acorns can ripen a little bit off the tree, but it's best to not, um, not yank them all off. We don't have, we don't need to do that. So yes, earlier someone asked, are we gonna be harvesting off the tree? Yeah, if you can, that's awesome. Are you going to probably mostly be picking off the ground? Yeah, that's probably more likely. So here we go, Valley Oak, look at this acorn, look at these leaves. All right, I'm also gonna take you over, let's look at the trunk for a minute. We'll try not to look at some of the really gross things that are on the ground here in this urban park. Um, acorn harvesting is a great time to also pick up trash. Um, I almost always, bring gloves because um, yeah, dog feces and trash are pretty common in our urban parks. Um, if you're going to be doing this with children, please have the safe trash talk before you do work. And if you're going to pick up trash, make sure that you bring a bag and, and talk about reasonable things to pick up and what not to pick up. I wish I didn't have to say that, but I do unfortunately. So this is pretty classic bark of a valley oak um, of medium to old age um, when they're younger. We'll look at some that are a little younger. Um, they're not quite as chunky. So they get these nicely furrowed bark. It has these deep fissures in it. You can actually grab a chunk. Um, it's often this, this nice dark gray color. Is it good to know? This tree's got a little bit of moss that'll turn green in the winter when it has some water. Um, there's some ground squirrel burrows. It's very common. Ground squirrels love to live with the trees. And in general, they don't kill um, large mature trees like that. This, they'll definitely eat baby trees. So to be a little thoughtful, they're part of the ecosystem. In this park, actually the ground squirrels are doing most of the tree planting, so I appreciate them. So we have this really nice arching canopy that goes up and over. It's pretty tall, this tree's about 55 feet tall, I just got hit by an acorn. Thank you, tree. And then these nice weeping branches that go all the way down and touch the ground. Um, I, I like to have picnics under oak trees. Now, um, actually, this is a really perfect moment. Let me see if I can get better light on me to talk about especially valley oak trees and how safe they are. This is a really dangerous time of year to be under a valley oak tree. Um, I talked about this at the uh, Wednesday, but these trees, when they get stressed out or they have too heavy an acorn crop or something else is going on, they will drop really large branches and they can hurt or kill people. So I don't want to freak you out. I just want you to be aware. I feel very safe and comfortable here because um, I can hear what's going on in my surroundings. 
and it doesn't happen immediately. Um, they start, these trees make incredible noises before they drop big branches. They creak, they crack, and they groan. And actually wh where I am right now is one of the safer places. I'm right up against the trunk. This is one of the safer places. The other safest place is to be outside of the canopy. It's not gonna like launch branches off. They're gonna fall straight down with gravity because this tree has huge branches, they're really heavy. So um, please don't harvest with your headphones in and it being really loud. Um, have a quick talk with your kids about talking trees if you're gonna take them into the forest and, and how you need to be aware of talking trees. They're letting you know they don't wanna hurt you. Um, and please be safe. We really don't want anyone hurt by falling trees. All right, uh, let's see. Let's see if I can find some other cool stuff under this tree and hopefully I won't make you too nauseous. Oh, I can't resist. I know we need to talk more about species, but let's look at this really quick. I bet you guys have seen these before on oak trees, right? Right, these are, um, people call them oak apples. They are not apples. They are created by the oak tree. But, um, and this is really neat because we've got a bunch that are, I'm gonna flip you around. Um, we've got fresh ones and we've got old ones. So there are lots and lots of different little cynipid wasps. You can't see them, they're not like stinging wasps. They just live here um, with the oak trees in the forest. And they, um, this is the house of a, of a, a larval cynipid wasp, um, my favorite, of course. And you can see this one's fresher, this one's older. So these are structures that the tree grew out of their tissue um, after the wasp, oh, here's a fresh one, this green one up here. After the wasp laid an egg into the stem tissue, this, um, these little galls were made. And so like this one's this year, this one's fresh, it's green, it's squishy. So there's a cinnipid wasp larva in here. If you were to take this gall off the tree and put it in a jar, you would eventually um, have some sort of wasp come out of it. That can be a fun thing to do with kids. They're little teeny, teeny, tiny wasps. And it's really fascinating. There's um, sometimes different generations of the wasp actually make different galls on stems and leaves. So anything strange that you see hanging from an oak tree is for the most part has to do with a, a cinnipid wasp and is their home. Um, they, they're really fun to throw at your siblings because they're kind of light. And you can also do some cool projects where you can make ink out of them. Um, it's rumored that the Declaration of Independence was signed in oak gall ink. Oh, here we go. I was trying to find this. Let's see if I can get this on camera. So we were talking about on Wednesday about oak pollen and um, oak tree flowers. Here's some oak tree flowers that I just found. Let's see if I can get them in focus with my face. So these are catkins, which is, and these are the male or pollen producing flowers of the oak tree. They look really tiny and innocent, don't they? But these are the guys that make all that pollen that makes us all sneeze in the summer. So when you're out looking for acorns, you'll probably find some dried up catkins from this, this spring if you look really closely at your tree. So just to go over really quickly, Quercus lobata um, identification. They're tall, wide, and droopy trees if they have not been pruned. They have really dark gray, thick bark. They have these leaves that are lobed and or double lobed. Let's see if I can get you in here. These are even bigger because I think because they're in the shade. Let's go out to the outer canopy. <clears throat> see if I, oh, here's some nice fresh ones. These aren't quite as double lobed. See if I can get them on there so you can see. Hopefully it'll get in focus. And then the acorns have those, they're large and they're green and they have big warty caps. Let's see if I can find some more. There were a bunch on this side of the tree. There appear to be, oh, here look at this one. This one's little. Let's see if we can get you on there. So size where isn't doesn't really matter. Uh, we love all sizes. All sizes are beautiful, as long as they're ripe. Um, acorns that have not come out of their caps are not ripe yet. All right. So, Chow, why don't you go ahead and put up the next slide, and I'm going to quickly relocate for our next one.
here's another lovely tree in front of me. This is a blue oak or Quercus douglasii. And I can tell actually without even getting close to it that it is a blue oak because even though the canopy is touching the ground, it's not weepy, it's more round and the branches are more, they're more zigzaggedy. I, I know that's not the best description, but that's all I've got for you. So I, I pretty much always will look at the shape of a tree from far away if I'm looking forward to um, identifying it. Also, something that you'll realize when you come in and look at lots of them is that out in nature, the blue oaks actually have a really distinct blue tinge to them and the valley oaks don't as much. I just stepped in a squirrel hole. Watch out for squirrel holes when you're out wandering about in the woods like I am right now. Um, let's see if I can get decent light to show you the valley oak I was just under. In comparison, you can see it's much more weeping with branches that are um, touching down on the ground. Thanks, Chow. I know I told you to go to this slideshow and then I started talking and showing things. So let's go back to that slideshow for real this time. Try and get some decent light for you. Hey, hi again, there we are. All right, so Quercus douglasii, and you can see in some of these pictures, some of that zigzaggy branching pattern I was talking about. Um, in this case, um, this valley oak and blue oak are living next to each other, basically in the same space. That's pretty common. Um, but in places where there's more differentiated oaks, the blue oaks tend to be in the higher and drier sections, and the valley oaks will be a little bit lower, closer to water sources like creeks and streams on the lower terraces and, and even up into the creek and stream. Like they, they're pretty adaptable and they really like a lot of water. You will not find a blue oak usually, usually in a, a permanent water course. You might find them in a, in a stream that's only there in the winter, but um, they don't really like wet feet. So you won't find them in a, in a, per, in a stream that's there year round. So Quercus douglasii. Um, Oh, I just found some really cool oak gulls. Got distracted. At least I haven't seen any birds yet. If I really get distracted, it's because there's birds everywhere and I am distracted. Um, so the blue oak leaves are really distinctly different in most cases. However, they're also really variable. So here's one I just took off the tree. You can see it doesn't really have any lobes at all. It's just flat. It's entire. There's no spines. It just goes all the way around. And I highly recommend that you touch all the trees when you're out here learning them and going over what we talked about or just on your walk. You'll, if you grab a valley oak leaf and a blue oak leaf and you play with them together, the blue oak leaf is like twice as thick and you can feel that it has wax on it. It's like, it's, it feels very, very different than a valley oak leaf. I also found this one has a bunch of cool little galls on it. I don't know if I can get that in focus. These are disc galls, so. Um, same sort of insect that makes the great big oak apples, but these are tiny, teeny, tiny little leaf galls. All right, before I get too distracted. Um, other things that are very different about the blue oak, actually, Chow, can we go back to just me talking full screen? I'm gonna look at the tree. It's way more interesting than my slideshow. All right, um, let's see if I can find some leaves in the sun. All right, oh, and I found some other cool galls. So, um, Blue oak leaves, like I said, they can be a little variable. You'll see some of these have bumpy margins or edges. Um, sometimes they look almost even a little bit lobed. Um, this one, I also, there's some spiny turban galls on this leaf too. Yay! Uh, looking for galls is definitely a favorite pastime of acorn harvesting with kids. So um, yeah, look at the leaves, feel them. You'll see that they're waxy. Um, there was an acorn over here earlier. I'm gonna find it. There it is. Okay. Whew. All right. So here's an unripe blue oak acorn. You can see again, it's got that same warty cap as on Quercus lobata. This is Quercus douglasii. Um, it's not quite as deeply set as the valley oak acorn. Um, and if you, you were to grab your acorn in the field, you notice it's got a waxy coating on it too, much like the leaves do. Um, it's also not as pointy, although I've seen Quite a lot of variety, acorn shapes and sizes. You have to look at um, you have to look at them overall and not necessarily individually. It can be really hard to ID just a single acorn without a cap or a leaf. 
to go with it. So that's why um, I encourage you to be very thoughtful. If you're going to harvest in this park that has both, I would probably have a bag for blue oak acorns and a bag for valley oak acorns so I didn't have to sort later and get confused because it's, it's confusing. Um, this acorn's also not ripe. I'm giving it a little squeeze and it's like, nope, I'm staying on the tree. So we'll let that one be. Um, and I would say on average, unless we get some sort of crazy wind or another hot spell, which we might get both this later today and tomorrow, um, acorns from a tree drop over a period of about a week and a half to two weeks. So, you know, in looking at this tree, it's like, yeah, there's a couple acorns here. There's not a lot. Um, the ones that are here are not ready yet. So I'm gonna go under the canopy. Hopefully I'm not making you nauseous. Oh, we get to see if we can look at this acorn. This one's really rotund. Um, I really, yeah, I really like the blue oak acorns. This one, it looks more beret-like. You can see the acorns almost whiter than the cap. I'm sorry, the lighting's not great. Um, one of these days. Uh, there's a tree out here in this park that I'm in that has blue oak acorns that I swear are almost like marbles. They're just like almost as white as they are round. So I'm up under the canopy now. Um, you'll notice, like I said, the branching structure is a little bit more zigzaggy than your average valley oak. And I really like to look at the trunk. This one is a little, this isn't the best example ever, but for the most part, blue oaks or Quercus douglasii, they tend to have a much whiter trunk and um, their bark is usually not quite as chunky as the valley oak. This one's, this one's really pretty old. This is a big tree. So it's kind of chunky. Let's see if I can get the, the lighter colored bark so that you can really see it. It'd be way better if you guys were all with me, but we're gonna do what we can do. Look at how massive this tree is. This is a big old tree. All right, so blue oaks, they tend to all, almost always be rounder. Um, this zigzaggity branches. So this one is more zigzaggity to the ground instead of weeping. So that's something to definitely keep an eye on when you're trying to identify your tree. Um, I'm going to go back to somewhere you can see me and then look at Q&A again because I feel like I have to make sure I can see my screen too though. All right. So Jackie asked earlier, oh, do the blue oak acorns turn dark? Yeah, they, they do. They turn almost purple, which I love. I'll show you some a little later. Um, let's see. Janice was saying, I assume we harvest from the ground and not the tree. I think I answered this, but I, I will say it again. It's great if you can harvest from the tree. Um, the acorns are cleaner. They will have a little bit less insects in them, but not a ton because the acorn weevils, they do live in the tree canopy. Um, and um, it's unlikely that you'll be able to have a really good harvest without picking up off the, the ground, but it is possible depending on your location. And yes, Jackie, I'll definitely show you what they look like when we get them off the ground, just a little bit. Uh, when collecting acorn, if you don't have the cap, can you still use it? Um, so one thing I do encourage people to do if they're a little bit uncertain about their ID is to put a couple caps in the bag. Um, if you're asking if you can collect some and make cute little like fairy hats with them, um, absolutely. Uh, otherwise, we don't have a we don't have a real use for acorn caps other than, like I said, if you're uncertain of your ID, you're a little bit, you're like, oh, I'm pretty sure this is blue oak, but I'm a little bit uncertain. It's completely fine to put a couple leaves and a couple acorn caps in there, and that is usually enough to help us make sure we got it. All right, Janice wants to know when the acorns drop to do the heat. Um, so actually no one really knows exactly what the mechanism is that tells the oak trees it's time to release their acorns. Um, it seems to me in the time I've been doing this work that it's starting to happen earlier and earlier, which for me is concerning because these acorns are alive and they need to stay alive and viable until um, they are able to sprout and grow. And if they dry out before then they're gonna die. So if we continue to have really long hot spells later and later in fall, instead of first fall rains, it's severely gonna impact whether or not we have new baby oak trees in the forest. So if you wanna study exactly what the mechanism is that triggers them to drop, I would love to know the answer. Okay, I think we got most of it. Yeah, okay. Um, 
Cha, why don't you go back to the um, go back to the blue oak slide? I'm gonna turn off my camera because I don't make y'all see sick. And then I'm gonna go back to where I'm at, and then we're gonna move again. Okay, Let's see if I get the light okay here. So I did pick up some acorns this morning off the ground. And so um, as for our local oak species, the blue oak is always the one that is ripe first. And we are just at the beginning of the blue oak acorn drop from what I'm seeing out here today. So I have nice dark little acorn. Here's another nice dark little acorn I picked up. Oh, thank you, Chow. Hey, I also got a bright green one. So I'm trying to figure out how to do all this so you can see what I'm doing. So color and size can be extremely variable. You can actually almost see the wax on this one, right? It almost has, looks like it's it's got a like clear coat, like when you put it on your car and then you like buff it out and it gets all shiny. Totally the same thing on these acorns. So these are blue oak or Quercus douglasii, the tree that we were just looking at. Um, these are from a different or a variety of different trees because the tree we were just looking at has acorns on it, but they're not ripe yet. So not every tree is like, today is acorn day. Um, it's really, you know, it's a bell curve like everything else. So these are blue oak acorns. Let me find some valley oak acorns. I picked up yesterday. Um, the valley oaks, it still seems pretty early, although I've gotten reports in a couple places, they are definitely starting to drop. So it's definitely, if, you, if you're hoping to get valley oaks or you have a valley oak forest near you, it's definitely time to start scouting, which we'll talk about again later, but um, to basically start looking about what's up in the canopy and what's available. So here's another nice valley oak acorn I picked up. I don't know if you can see. So a squirrel, I just got hit with another one. Thank you, tree. So a squirrel um, was up in the canopy and took a bite out of this and damaged it and then left it and didn't eat it. Thank you, squirrel. Um, here's another one. It's showing, whoops, like a nice brown color. Here we go. Like towards when they get ripe. This one looks pretty good. Unfortunately, this one also has a hole in it but this whole wide color variation is quite reasonable. And then, then this one, this one's kind of patchy colored. It's got a couple different shades on it, which would be fine, except it's stuck in a cap. So I can tell you that this acorn is not good. There's something wrong with it. And it's very normal for the tree to shed the not good acorns right before it starts dropping the good ones. I think this is a very smart strategy, right? If you're gonna feed a bunch of hungry ground squirrels, you wanna throw off the garbage first, right? And let them get all like fat and happy and satisfied and then drop your good ones. So I've decided oak trees are quite smart. Oh, this is a good one. This is also a blue oak acorn that has a lot of big giant squirrel nibbles in it. Yeah, this one is no good. All right. Oh, I see Q&A is going again. Let's see. So I, I hope that this um, shows you what they look like when you pick them up off the ground. Um, it can be quite variable. I picked up mostly good ones. So like if you're working with kiddos, um, I usually try and take them and make sure that we're walking on a really slow walk. Um, and yes, things like this squirrel bitten one, we don't want this. This is a valuable food source for the squirrels that live here that we also love. 
we don't want this for our project. We only want really high quality good acorns and we only want to take a small amount so that we're not harming anything. Um, our permits and our collection standards are that we only harvest 5% of the acorns from any one tree, any one grove of trees or any one woodland. So we wouldn't take, so this tree right now today that I'm under is dropping pretty good. I would say that I would guess there's probably a hundred um, really good viable acorns under this tree. So I wouldn't take more than 10 from this tree. So if you're harvesting with yourself or others, make sure you keep moving, um, you know, if your kiddos bring you one like the squirrel eating one, be like, wow, that's really cool. And then leave it behind. Um, you might wanna keep them in front of you though, so that if you're throwing the bad ones behind you, that they don't keep up picking up the same acorns because that definitely happens. Um, let's see, is there a time frame to harvest? So it, it kind of needs to happen continuously. I mean, especially this park during the day, the squirrels are sleeping. Um, they come out later in the evening or, or at nighttime and or climb up in the trees or when there's not people around. There's a lot of people in this park. So um, yeah, I would recommend that you go a little earlier in the morning. Most places it's calmer and quieter. And um, as soon as the sun, I mean, the, the trees dropping acorns as they ripen probably all night long. So um, yeah, you want to pick them up off the ground within probably a day or two. When they sit on the ground too long, especially if they're in the sun, if you get an acorn and you pick it up and it's hot, uh, or if you're picking, or if you are gathering off of asphalt, you want to get them as soon as you can. Um, we have done some non-scientific germination tests on acorns that we've gotten from some really special oaks that are in asphalt. They're they're basically in asphalted parking lots and they have no soil around them. And um, the acorns, we have super low germination rates because I think they just bake on the pavement. So if you can get them as fresh as possible is the best. Um, let's see, yeah. The squirrel bait ones are really fun to look at and play with, but they're not worth collecting. Um, and does one small hole ruin the acorn? That's a good question, let's see, I just had one. I don't know if you guys are gonna be able to see this. I wish I had um, in my wish list for, my wish list is that we don't have to do it like this, that we can actually meet in person, which has such a broader amount of um, availability to talk about things that we see and to touch the trees. But if not, and we have to do this, I'm gonna get better cameras so I can see if I can do stuff like show you. I'm trying really hard guys. So this one has a weevil in it. I don't know if you can see it, it's very small. It's a teeny tiny little pinprick right here in the shell of this acorn. And if you notice these, especially on a good acorn year like this, we're not gonna take this one. However, just cause there's a weevil in an acorn doesn't mean it's not gonna grow. It just means that the weevil is eating some of the food that will help the, the, the tree grow. You're going to get weevily acorns, even if you think you've harvested perfect, perfect acorns. So um, yeah, if you see problems with them, let's leave them behind. We don't wanna be taking, you know, this is great food still, or this could still grow into a, a new tree here in this woodland. Are green acorns on the ground separated from their caps considered ripe? Yes, Dan, they are. Um, don't be fooled by color. The only time we want you to really pay attention to the color of the acorn on the ground is if it's gone to like dried out, ha <laughs> ha. It's gone to like really, really dried out brown. I know the light here is bad um, because then it's because it's super dried out. Doop, doop, let's find some sun. The problem with the sun is then I can't see what you guys can see. So this one's super dried out. This is, this is too, it's gone from the like luscious healthy brown to like this pale tan. Also, it just, it does feels crummy. So this is too dried out. This one also has a squirrel nibble on it. Let's see. Ah, thank you for the great question, Jeanette. Are these trees far enough to apart to harvest from? So, we don't care if there's native trees really close together or even if these trees are hybridizing one another because they're both native trees. We're only concerned about if there are non-native oak trees really close to these trees. And I happen to know they're not because I've checked out this park. Um, 
So that's, that is a really important thing to remember. So as long as the trees are native, we don't care how close together they are. Um, yeah, it's hard to determine 10% of the acorns. Um, there's a couple of different ways to do that. Um, you can either, you know, estimate the number you think that are there, or the other thing that I will often do is be like, okay, we're only gonna harvest in this little section of the canopy. And I'll, 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 be, I'll tell my, usually it's kids that I'm harvesting with, I'll be like, we're only gonna take acorns from right here and then we're gonna move on. So you're never gonna be perfect. The trick is to just take acorns from a lot of trees. Don't get stuck on one tree that is losing a bumper crop. You know, take a good amount. I'd probably say don't ever take more than like 100 acorns from any one tree and keep moving on. All right, and I will answer the rest of those questions a little later. So we're gonna take a five minute break so I can relocate so we can learn the interior live oak, oak tree. And then we will talk about all of those other specifics about what bags to use and where to find harvesting spots and everything else. So Chow, do you wanna throw up the intermission sign and everybody get a drink of water or if you have an oak tree outside, go grab an acorn to look at just for fun. Um, do some jumping jacks and we'll be back in five minutes or so. Oh, hey, Chow, the intermission slide's at the very end of the presentation, but you can just put up quick as with Lizani, that's also okay.
Okay, I moved. I'm back. I hope you can see me okay. I realized that if I am in the sun, I can't see the screen, so I can't see where we are, which makes it really, really hard. Um, when you get a moment, Chow, let's go back to uh, the Quercus Wizzles Zenny slide. You are the best, by the way. Um, everyone give a silent round of applause for Chow, managing the tech piece of this. And thank the internet for actually having a strong enough cell signal on the internet for us to be able to do this and to actually talk to you from a place where there's trees rather than in a building, which is really fun. And yes, this is the first time we've tried a live from the field class. So um, feel free to hit us up with all your strongest criticisms later and we'll do our very, very best to um, try and fix that because yeah especially if we have to keep doing this later. <laughs> I want to be back in the forest with all of you. I really can't wait. Hey, there we go. All right, so I, I did say earlier, we're going to talk about three different oak species because they're the main three that you find um, in the valley floor and really the main three that we harvest and grow for our projects. So we've covered uh, Quercus lobata. We've covered Quercus douglasii, and now we're moving, and those are both within the um, Quercus section. So now we're going to move to our um, Lobate section oak that we are harvesting for this program, which is Quercus wislazeni, the interior live oak, which, yes, is distinct from the coast live oak. Although um, in Sacramento, I will tell you that most of the oaks that are planted here that are supposedly interior live oak are not. Um, the nursery trade seems to have a really big problem with having um, actually type specific interior live oaks. So um, be really thoughtful if you wanna plant one of these trees, which if you would like to have an evergreen oak and you live in Sacramento or Rockland or Lincoln or um, Loomis or Fair Oaks or any of these places, um, <clears throat> I highly re recommend you plant the interior live oak. But there's a really gnarly fungus that um, an insect brings along that gets into the acorns, especially of the coast live oaks, that makes them leak this like brown sap. It's called drippy nut fungus. And it's gross. And it doesn't seem to impact the interior live oaks. So that's my pitch for getting actually the tree you want to plant for your yard. <clears throat> All right. so. Interior live oaks are great because they're super tough as nails. Um, they'll grow in really interesting places like the mine tailings um, piles out in Folsom. The coast live oaks will grow on those. Same thing along the American River Parkway. Like they're actually okay growing in kind of like rock. Um, we plant them in some of the like engineered basins out in uh, like out in uh, Rancho Cordova. They don't seem to care about um, all these things that most plants really would be bothered by, like a really crummy soil. And they just kind of grow and, and they are great habitat trees. Um, I'm looking at um, a Vareo, I believe, and there's some bluebirds that cruise through out here in this park. So um, cool tree, cool tree. So these are an evergreen oak tree. And that means that they always have leaves, although um, they're always dropping leaves too. Um, these trees often look kind of sparse, like they're missing some of their leaves, but that's kind of just the way that they look. Um, I think this is probably a way that they deal with the uh, water stress and making sure they get enough sunlight is that they don't try and have too many leaves. They're pretty smart. So they have these really different, distinctly different acorn caps from the ones we've looked at so far. These acorn caps are feathery. They're not bumpy or warty. Um, and the acorns, they look really similar to the other acorns we've looked at when when they're not ripe yet. Um, and then once they become all the way ripe and often when they're ready to come off the trees, they are this lovely golden brown with stripes. Um, you can harvest them green as long as they come out of their caps. This one, some insect or some animal knocked off the tree. It's not ripe yet. Um, if you do harvest them green and then we go put them in storage, they slowly turn into this, th this picture that you have of the really luscious um, golden brown stripy acorns. Um, unlike our friends, Quercus lobata and Quercus douglasii that we saw earlier today, these acorns take 18 months to ripen from when um, pollination occurs. And actually this is really important because especially in woodlands like the one I'm in today, 
Um, acorns are a critical food source for a lot of the wildlife here. And so having these trees that bear on alternate um, seasons can really help make sure that there's always acorns present for wildlife because um, this acorn was pollinated and would be ripening this year. It was pollinated not this last spring, but the spring before. So if you get a really lousy um, spring in which there, hang on a second, I got a lot of young people shouting. I don't know if you can hear them. All right, I'm back. Hopefully they're moving on. Uh, the problem with live taping, sometimes other people show up and they wonder what the heck I'm doing in the woods with a music stand and a headset. Um, so forests that have trees that, that bear in a, just like a six month cycle and then an 18 month cycle, they are more frequently consistently have acorns present. So there's a lot of species like acorn woodpeckers that um, are almost always in forests that have both um, 18 month acorns and single year acorns. So having interior live oaks and valley oaks or interior live oaks and blue oaks is a really big boon for, um, for habitat for wildlife. All right, let's see. Um, how about we go just to me and we're gonna look at the tree a little closer. I'm gonna see if I can't make this work for you. So if you remember we talked about how the interior live oak has kind of two different leaf shapes. You can maybe see it here. There's some that are spiny and that, but most of the leaves on the tree don't have any spines on the margins. They're not pokey at all. And um, in Q and A, Eric Webb was saying, hey, is that um, an adaptation to keep things from eating the young growth? Um, that's the guess that people have. That makes sense that the newer, fresher shoots would have more protection. Um, unfortunately, we can't ask the tree and say, was your intention in growing spines to not be eaten? Um, but that seems like a very thoughtful and likely reason that um, you would have two different leaf shapes. Um, these leaves are also fairly thick, but not as thick as the blue oak. And super important if you're looking at trying to decide if it's an interior live oak or a coast live oak, you want to look at the bottom side of the leaf. Um, there's no hairs especially not along this mid vein. Let's see if I can get a better picture. Um, there's no hairs. Um, if you, when you're looking at a coast live oak tree, there's two things you'll notice. First of all, these leaves are very flat. Coast live oak leaves are, are very often cupped and the tree in general is much, much more spiny. Also on the bottom sides of the leaves, they will have little tufts of hair um, where, the, where the side veins in your leaf meets this main vein down the middle, it'll be hairy. So just remember the girls from the coast have hairy armpits. You can say you learned it here. I learned that at school in UC Davis and it stuck with me and it works really well. If your tree, when you look at the bottom side of the leaf has hairy armpits, then you need to worry that it is not an interior live oak and it's not something that we want for our project. Um, the thing about coast live oak and interior like live oak acorns is they look almost identical. So that's not a very good distinguisher for um, what kind of tree you have, unfortunately. They look very, very, very similar. Although I think personally that uh, coast live oak acorns tend to be um, fatter and not as pointy and skinny. But yeah, that's not a great thing to go. So I'm gonna try and step back and look at this tree. You can see it's kind of sparse. It's not super leafy. Um, it's very rounded. Um, the branches come down to the ground and then I'm gonna try and walk and tuck you in here without making us all nauseous. So we can look at the trunk, look at some of the garbage under the tree, which is unfortunately ubiquitous around here, it seems. So you'll notice that this tree has like, it's kind of sideways and it's got like maybe what, six to eight trunks. This is very, very common for interior live oak or Quercus wislizeni. It's very uncommon for them to have a single trunk. Um, they can, they do, but it's not very common. So if it has many trunks, and I like to say, I like to think that the bark looks, let's see if I can get in here. The bark makes them look like elephant legs. This elephant leg bark is probably an interior live oak. All right. Oh, there's a little bird nest. Let's see if we can look at it. Or what's left of a little bird nest up in the tree. Yeah, you can't see that. The light's too bad. All right. So those are the three oak trees that I want you to try and get to be best friends with. Um, as we talked about a lot 
on Wednesday, we have to make sure that we are finding harvesting locations where there's not um, a lot of non-native oaks because we are really concerned about unintentional hybridization. And I keep seeing questions pop up that are like, wait, so where do we go to harvest? So we can help with this. We have a lot of locations that we have determined are acceptable for harvesting. I think the best way for you to decide where to harvest and for us to all work together, and we'll talk about this even more at the end, is for you to complete training and then sign up to be part of our Slack channel and or email us and we'll have a conversation about where you are, where you'd like to harvest, and some of the options that are right for you. So let's go back to our presentation, Chow, so I can zoom through and make sure that we get all of our other stuff because it's 1128. And I want to make sure that we answer, get through the critical stuff. Oh, so there's a bunch of questions. What, what park I'm at? Yeah, I'll definitely go at that later because this is a really good one to learn, um, especially. Let's go to the next slide, okay? Even if you're, um, actually, I don't believe that I, I don't believe we've received permission to harvest here yet. So definitely, if this weekend you want to come out for a walk, this is a great park. Um, to look at the trees. I'll even show you what trees I was looking at with you this morning. Um, but as far as harvesting, don't harvest here yet. I need to make sure we have our permit. Um, unfortunately, the, a lot of our permits come from city staff members and they change. And like, especially right now, it's very hard to get in touch with certain city staff members to make sure that we've got all of our permissions in place. Let's talk how to harvest. Yes. Here we go, we're gonna go through the details. I think I'm gonna answer quite a few of the questions that are in Q&A in this section. And if not, um, I'll make sure to go back and that we definitely get those answered. So let's see what's next to keep me on track. Oh yeah, safety. This is really, really important. Um, I really want to make sure everyone is safe. Um, poison oak is the picture on the slide. If you don't know poison oak, please learn it. You will run into poison oak. Please don't let your kids get covered in poison oak. Um, I also, when I'm out and about in public in poison oaky places, I don't pet dogs. I've actually gotten poison oak from petting cute dogs on the trail. So don't do that. Um, sorry, I have to have the second one here, but a lot of places where there's great oak trees, um, there's also unhoused people living. Um, that's just not a good situation. So please be thoughtful about where you're going. And if you cannot go alone, I think it's really a great idea. Um, take your puppy friends. It's really a great, this is a great dog walking project as well. Um, wasps, dogs, and snakes are all things that I have seen while um, out dealing with this project. And um, a lot of this I deal with by being dressed appropriately. I don't know if you guys can see I'm wearing my sun protection. I put on my sunscreen. I got my boots on. I have long pants. Um, all of these things will help you not get poked and stung. Um, the snakes, they don't want to be, the snakes don't want to be with you either. So like I, I've I've worked outdoors in the field. I've seen lots of rattlesnakes and I've only ever had one that got a little bit too close. So as long as you're paying attention to your surroundings, you don't need to be worried. Um, it is stuff to talk about with your kids though to make sure they know all of the things to be thinking about, but don't scare them. Just make sure that they um, are prepared and know what to do if they do see a snake um, or something else and that you'll be okay. We talked about summer limb drop earlier. Um, it's most prevalent with valley oak trees. Um, other factors though are wind. So like I think it's supposed to get super windy tomorrow evening. Don't go acorn harvesting when it's super windy. It's just not a good idea. So wait until after the wind blows through and all the acorns are on the ground. All the ripe ones have been knocked out and then um, it'll be a good time to go. So maybe Monday or Tuesday evening might be a, a good time to go to potentially try and harvest. Um, yeah, please be safe. If you have any questions about safety or strategies or anything else, I'm happy to talk about it offline. Uh, next one, please, Joe. Oh yeah, scouting. I thought this picture was funny. That's why I put it in here because I look really confused. So I use this term scouting and um, I, I anticipate if you're gonna be working, especially if you're going to like take your kids or take a Girl Scout group or go with your church friends, I highly recommend you check it out before you go to harvest. You can do these things at the same time. Right, so like, you know, this morning I came to the park and I did some scouting to see where the acorns are. Um, for myself, I also did a little bird watching. Um, 
it just is really helpful. There's nothing that is more disappointing for like a group of kids than to go on an acorn harvest and not find any acorns or have them not be ready yet. So um, I would just suggest that you make sure you know what you're getting into. So go there first and you know, this doesn't have to be an intensive process. This year looks pretty good. There's acorns in a lot of places, um, but I do recommend that you do that first or show up half an hour earlier before everyone else and just get a lay of the land. This also allows you to look for things like people living in the forest or dangerous trash, et cetera. So uh, scouting is important. Uh, one thing that surprises people sometimes, if you go somewhere just to check things out, please report this activity because it's really important to us to know, are there acorns present? Are there not? Are they ripe yet? Are they not? Like this is super helpful and can help us, you know, maximize our effort for harvesting, minimize our carbon footprint for just moving ourselves around. Um, all information, if you go anywhere and you're like, I went to this park and there are no acorns anywhere, it's super helpful information. So please share that. Uh, next slide, please. Aha, locations. Yes, the hot, hot topic. So we've been compiling um, location information, checking locations to make sure they meet our criteria as far as physical distance from non-native oak trees within the same section of the oak family uh, for, a, for a very long time. Um, places where there's lots of oak trees are best. So um, for example, I saw a couple of questions about like some of the CCSD parks um, there are a few, maybe one or two. There's a couple that have some really great oak trees in them. I have to say most of Elk Grove is really hard to harvest in because there's really cool big oak trees here and there, but as far as like a really good solid forest of oak trees, there's not very many places like that. So I think it was you, Jeanette. We'll definitely um, check in about that. Um, we are good friends with the Kasumnas Community Services District's folks. And I don't know if they've signed our permit yet, but they, they every year do give us permission to work in their parks. Um, permits, yeah, so we work pretty aggressively to make sure that we are permitting this activity. Um, people are often surprised um, and actually sometimes the people we're asking for permits from are surprised about this but um, in most public lands it's actually not legal to take anything rocks leaves feathers flowers acorns um, and there is actually potential for damage to the environment and to the ecosystem if it were to get too overdone so um, this has been something that is slowly like creeping into the public awareness, especially with some uh, with certain plant populations. So like um, there's a big kerfuffle last year within the native plant um, community of some contractors that were working on some projects in Southern California who went through a couple of preserve properties and basically stripped every seed from a specific plant without any permits or permission. And you know, this can actually be really devastating if it's a plant that grows every year from seed and you take all the seed, that's a big problem. So we wanna just make sure that we are doing three things that we're communicating about our project, that we are holding ourselves to a high standard and that we're making sure that everyone is, um, understands the ethical complications with harvesting so that we can make really good decisions. Um, so there's also some gray area when it comes to permitted harvesting areas. So for example, Within the city of Sacramento and actually every city, if the acorns are on the sidewalk, um, the city considers them trash and would love for you to get rid of them. <laughs> um, when I've actually asked, and there's very few trees in most of these city places that we can actually harvest from with our other restrictions, but on occasion we found them. And I always laugh because they're like, yeah, please go pick up all the acorns off the sidewalk. We're not gonna get sued when somebody trips. So things like city sidewalks, um, and actually road edges, especially ones that are managed by Caltrans, these are no man's land and um, nobody cares and they see these natural materials as trash. So um, we don't have permits clearly for certain, for road edges. Um, road edges are also really dangerous and usually not appropriate for harvesting with kids or groups. But there are some circumstances where these are really good places to um, make sure that we get seed sources from remnant woodlands. So in a situation like that, where it is like a public no man's land, just reach out to me and we can talk about whether or not um, it's reasonable to harvest there, what the risks are involved in it, and if we think that we should to deal with some of those issues. So some, some examples of these places are um, like along the Garden Highway north of Sacramento. 
there's some places where there's some oak trees that are dropping on the on the roadway edge that um, and having that seed source as part of our our nursery genetics can actually be pretty important so um, private property is its own thing. Um, private property you can harvest on as long as you have permission from the private property owner. So I often have people who come to this and they're like, hey, my neighbor has a 70 acre ranch. Can I harvest there? Yeah. If your friend says yes, go crazy. Um, or people that are related to other organizations that have trees and oak groves. Uh, we do ask that you get them to, it's, it, we have a really short piece of paper that you will get emailed as part of your packet. It will be available online that you, we ask that you send to them so that they can just sign it and say, yeah, I give permission. So we have a paper trail in case anyone wants to know how we got permission. Um, our project boundaries. So the Sacramento Tree Foundation services the six county SACOG region. That's uh, Sutter, Uber, Yuba, Placer, El Dorado. Um, so I, I got lost, okay, sorry. Sacramento, Yolo, Sutter, Placer, Yuba, and El Dorado counties. There I got all six. Um, so those are, are the areas that we harvest in. We tend to not go above about 2,500 feet in El Dorado County. El Dorado County goes all the way over into the Lake Tahoe Basin. Um, and uh, the only oak trees that go up in that area are Quercus cologii, the black oak. So um, we, we will often take some, sorry, that's not true. There's also Quercus berberifolia, which is um, the scrub oak or local scrub oak. So we will we will have small amounts of those, but they're not high on our need list. So, I mean, unless you're already going to be in an area with those oak species, we wouldn't encourage you to necessarily travel unless you really want to go on an adventure to see if you can find those. And we don't spend a lot of time getting permits. So usually all of the seed we get from those areas are from uh, private property collecting um, or, or other contacts, so. Let's see. Oh, this last one that I, I don't know if I remember to mention on Wednesday. We don't want to be harvesting from trees we know were planted. And the reason why is that um, we don't know where the trees that were planted came from. And especially if it was a project done by some of our favorite folks, such as um, the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, they don't know either because they don't think about these things and um, it's kind of problematic. So unless you know the provenance of the parent tree, we don't want you to harvest from a planted tree. All right, I wonder if there's like a million questions on this right now. I'm gonna go back to Q&A. Let's see. <clears throat> so basically, I think I, I did answer, but I'll say again, Janice, we're not gonna, um, we would like you to tell us where you're going to go harvesting, but we'll work with you um, to, figure out what works, what's close to you and what's gonna work for you. One of the reasons we like to know if you've been scouting or if you've harvested is so that we don't all converge on one park and try and harvest together. That's why we ask that you report and just communicate um, because there's definitely, and this happens frequently, some of our favorite harvesting places that are easy to access. Pretty early on, I'll go, no more harvesting from here. Feel free to go take a walk and check out the acorns, but we're not accepting any more submissions. Um, so, cause we don't, we, like I said, we don't wanna, do a lot of harm. So that's why. I'm going to get into harvesting materials. Um, as far as the timeline, so usually we have harvested into very early December a couple of times. The only thing that we're harvesting that late in the season is the interior live oak acorns. Um, there will be no more blue oak acorns available by probably the second or third week in October. They just will, will be done falling. What's left on the ground will be dried out and not useful. Um, and then there's usually like the first week in November is the very latest I've ever harvested Valley Oak Quercus Lobata acorns. So there's definitely a time frame, and the time frame is now. Um, in the past, we did schedule trainings a little earlier, but it was hard because we couldn't show you stuff because it wasn't ready. And also people usually they get trained and they're raring to go. So we try and do training right now because right now is when this project starts and when you can start harvesting. Yeah, the, the six counties, I think I said it, I'll say it again. It's Sacramento, Yolo, Sutter, Yuba, Placer, and El Dorado counties. And this is the same as our Sacramento Area Council of Governments footprint is the same service area that the Sacramento Tree Foundation has decided to provide services in. Is there a way to tell if a tree or forest was planted? Yeah, this is a really, I get this question a lot. and. Um, 
if you are in Folsom and mucking around, think about this a lot because Folsom is very interesting. Um, so usually the trees, you can usually tell if trees have been planted um, because of how they're arranged, how they look, um, if they're in a grid or a straight line. However, not always. Sometimes a straight line is there used to be a fence line because acorn, um, especially scrub jays are notorious for planting acorns right next to fence posts. So you have to be a little careful with that one because you do get straight lines of, of oak trees just because there was a fence. Um, I think most of what I'm talking about, it's pretty obvious. Um, so I, a lot of the trees in cities, in medians, you know, um, they've been planted. So just uh, think critically about it. I mean, it's, there's no way for our project to be perfect. We're gonna probably get some unintentionally hybridized seed, which we usually notice at the nursery when they sprout. Um, and some other things, we're just doing our very best to do this in the most um, biologically appropriate and ethical way. Um, so if trees are planted, even in a natural area, we don't know where that tree was from. Um, we actually are trying to encourage people not to just plant trees in wild areas and for the cities to be a little more thoughtful within um, areas of high biological concern or integrity to not plant certain things. But this is a hard thing to get traction to because um, it seems like just the, the thought about the biological needs of an organism like a tree is hard for people to think about. Um, also, their lifespans are long. So yeah, I would not harvest from a tree that you suspect is planted or from within 2000 feet of it, right? If there's a huge planting, right now, you know, there's a caveat for that. If the trees are less than like 10 years old, they're not producing pollen. So there's a couple of places in Folsom that we are very aggressively harvesting right now because they're going to no longer be available to us because of some of the planting work that's been done there. And somebody missed part of class. Yeah, we're, we are hopefully recording. Um, Wednesday was recorded. We're getting the Wednesday stuff um, ready to be posted. Um, and we hope to get it done as soon as we can. Our staff is working as hard as we can to get everything out quickly um, with the materials and uh, restrictions we have given everything going on right now. So yeah, we're, um, we will do everything we can to get you up to speed. If that's showing you recordings, letting you look at PDFs, having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, um, checking in over FaceTime to talk Oak ID. We're here. We want to help you guys help us. And yeah, I'm going to cover everything else that we need to do. Um, for our project every year, we harvest about 10,000 acorns. That's to meet our needs for planting this fall and winter for our uh, seed to seedling program that is in third grade classrooms and hopefully can be accessed this year. And, and also for our nursery uh, propagation, which supports our reforestation plantings for the next two years. So, all right. Let's get back to the rest that we have to get in here. We have 15 minutes. I'm gonna do my very best to get it all in. Let's do the next slide, please, Chow. All right. So if you're not shoot, sure about what 2000 feet is and if you should be looking for trees and what to do, measure it. Um, if you have a smartphone, there's a lot of great apps to help you with this. If you don't, or if you're going to a place that we don't know about and haven't already checked out, we can measure stuff and make maps for you. 2,000 feet is a really long distance. So I'm here at this little red dot. Um, I'm in Johnson Springview Park in Rockland. I'm just south of Springview Middle School. I'm right where the red dot is in that, the left, leftmost panel. And if you see, I was measuring 2,000 feet, which is a long ways. It's what, 0. Um, 0.379 miles. Yeah, so this whole neighborhood, so um, basically everything south, south um, east of me to the railroad tracks, this neighborhood I have cruised through and looked for suspect oak trees, and then everything north to, to Whitney Boulevard through the old Whitney golf, golf Course, I've tromped and driven through this whole area looking for oak trees, uh, non-native oak trees to see if we can harvest here. And what I've learned is this park is within our criteria for the Quercus section oaks, Valley Oak, Quercus lobata, and Live Oak, uh, I'm sorry, Valley Oak, Quercus lobata, and Blue Oak, Quercus douglasii, the Quercus section 
oaks, we can harvest here. It, this is an approved location. However, for interior live oak, our lobate um, species oaks, this is not an approved um, planting location because there's far too many non-native uh, low body groups or red oak oaks nearby. There's a lot of them. And this is pretty uh, normal for our project. Um, in a lot of places, like much of the American River Parkway is also the same. We can harvest our white oak group oaks or the Quercus section oaks, but we can't harvest the Lobate section oak, um, the interior live oak. So the um, to be on alert, be on alert when you're harvesting, even more when you're harvesting interior live oak. Um, yeah, you probably have questions about that, but we're gonna keep going. Uh, next please, Chow. All right, so we've touched on this off and on all day. Uh, we're looking for genetically appropriate native acorns, which means um, they come from native oak trees that weren't planted, that are not unintentionally hybridized by um, some other non-native oak. We want our collection to be genetically diverse, so we would like to harvest from as many locations, as many individual trees as possible, and we don't wanna have unintended selection occur. So when you're out picking up acorns, don't just pick up the big ones, or the small ones or the medium ones. We're gonna pick up everything that is healthy and try and have a full distribution of the healthy seed that is currently available. And there is a handout that speaks specifically to this. That will be part of the packet that will be emailed to you and will be online. Next, please, ciao. All right, so how do you actually do this? We've gotten to that part. So all of those things we've just talked about, you've got a place, you've checked it out, you know it's all right, you know what trees are there, you've decided how to pick up only 5% of the acorns. Um, I always bring a canvas bag or multiples if I'm harvesting multiple species of acorns so that I can just put them in there. Um, when I am done, when I've walked my harvesting circuit and I've seen all the trees I'm gonna do, I stop and have a little break, I have some water and then I'm going to sort through because even if I thought I did a perfect job of putting really healthy acorns in my bag, um, you're always gonna have ones that had holes you didn't see or cracked or otherwise. So we ask that you sort them at your harvesting site so you can put back anything that you actually don't wanna take. And that even lessens our impact even further. So that's what you can see in this bottom corner picture is some harvesters helping me sort. Actually, that is here at Johnson Springview Park a couple of years ago with my fabulous intern, Aneta. Um, as we're getting prepared to package them. So next slide, please. Ciao. And so we talked about uh, what a good acorn is. On Wednesday, I'm gonna go over it again. So every time you get an acorn, before you put it in your canvas bag, you wanna make sure the shell is fully intact. There's no holes. You don't see any weevil pokes. Um, you wanna give a shake. Rattly acorns are not viable. You want to give it a squeeze. Squishy acorns are gross and not viable. You want to make sure the cap's not still stuck on. Um, and then it's totally fine, the colors, the shapes, etc., as long as it meets all of those other criteria, you've got a healthy acorn. Now I put this picture with the acorn with a bunch of um, weevil larva exit holes that is growing just to point out just because they have weevils in them and weevil larva, they can still grow. It's just, um, it does take some of the energy away from that seedling. It's not ideal. And also um, our refrigerator bank in our office where we keep our 10,000 acorns, it gets really gross because the weevils munch out of the acorn shell. And then if they encounter a plastic bag, they munch through that too. And then they like fall and die in the bottom of our refrigerators. So um, we don't keep food in seed refrigerators in the office because it's gross if we do. Next slide, please. All right, um, so what we're gonna ask you to do after you've sorted them, if you're prepared and you bought your plastic Ziploc bags, which if you wanna just grab your own gallon Ziploc bags, that's helpful. If you need us to supply those, we can. We'll explain to you how to do that in our email with all the follow-up materials. Um, we count them and store them in a very specific way because when you have 10,000 acorns, you don't wanna sort them more than once. So we're gonna have you after you've sorted them, you're like, okay, these are the good ones. We count them into bags of 40, put 40 in a bag. And then because we can't count, you put in two more. And that is a bag of 40. And the reason we do this is because of the way our nursery propagation um, 
trays are set up and also our materials that we send out to classrooms and groups that grow for us, everything is focused on a unit of 40. So if it can show up in our office in a bag of 40 all ready to go, it makes our life really easy because then we can check your work, we make a notation of your submission, uh, we add horticultural vermiculite, which is a natural product that helps maintain their humidity once they're in cold storage. And then we can just put them in storage and not have to touch them again until it's time to use them. And um, this process really makes it a lot easier um, than having to resort. You can see in this um, picture here, my intern in the office, we had a submission that wasn't counted and sorted. And so she's sorting and counting and sorting and counting all day long. Um, this year, we're not able to invite interns in to train and have help us um, because of the situation. Our office is closed. We are trying not to have contact between people who don't live together. So it would be very helpful if we um, aren't doing a lot of sorting. However, that being said, sometimes things happen um, and we need to help. So communicate with us. I'm not saying we won't take submissions if they're not counted and, and sorted into bags, but um, it does help us a lot because this can take a lot of time. I have some very funny pictures of myself last season from, I think I was supervising a karate class for one of my kids and sorting and counting acorns. And yeah, people think I'm nuts. Haha, ha, there's my second nut joke. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so here's a picture of that bag. Um, you won't have the material that's in there, the vermiculite. We used to send this out with people, but we decided not to anymore because there is, um, it ha it's very dusty. Uh, it is a slightly potentially hazardous material. And if you are only gonna have your acorns in bags for a couple of days, it's, it's not a big deal that it's not in there. Um, it's really for longer term storage. So the important things here that, is that we wanna be using new or sterilized Ziploc bags. Um, we prefer the gallon ones, but um, for especially for valley oaks, like in a quart, they don't really fit. Um, but especially the smaller, the interior live oak acorns, usually the quart sign size is just fine. We we do ask that you count in 40 and then add two more acorns because it's it just we have to to always make sure we have at least 40 good acorns. And then this is important: the label. We really do need to know the species. There should only be one species of acorn in a bag. So um, even if you're at this park, if you harvested both Quercus lobata and Quercus douglasii, we'd want you to sort them separately and put them in separate bags. The other bonus to sorting and counting and packaging at a park is if you're a few short, you can go get a few more. If you have a, too many extra, you can go put them back. Um, once you go home, you can't really do that. Um, the location name is critical. If we don't know where they're from, we can't use them. Uh, we need the date that they were harvested. This is really important information that helps us keep tabs on what's going on. Um, your name or initials is helpful in case we have questions. And then the number in the bag should always be 40. Sometimes there's exceptions. So if the no, you know, so please write 40 on there, even if there's 40 plus two, um, unless something strange happens. And for some reason you gave us a bag of 80, you know, we'd want to know that, although we'd rather you gave us bags of 40. All right, what's next, Chow? We're getting close and then I'm going to answer more questions. Oh uh, yeah, one more, one more slide, please. How we're gonna work together. Oh, it's getting windy. So our favorite way and the way that we can be sure to provide you basically 24 seven acorn harvest support is over Slack, which is an app that you can use on a desktop or on a mobile device. Um, email is fine too. We would love to work with you over email. Um, you won't get a response from us over the weekend. Um, we try to not be attached to our email 24 seven. And that is one thing that we don't answer on the weekends. So Slack is great if you can use it. You will get an invite to Slack when you finish um, our, uh, we'll have a, other stuff we send you. Once we get that back, you'll get your invites to be part of this work group. And we already have harvesters from last seasons that have already been trained that are already burning it up and harvesting and they're on Slack. So um, there's a bunch of channels. So just really quickly, Acorn Harvest Announcements. Chow and I post announcements here. Um, if you have questions or want to chit chat about harvesting locations, there's a channel for that. If you wanna report any activity at all, it goes in the report activity. And if you need help or have a tree ID question, it goes there. And this is helpful because then if you wanna see all the other tree ID questions and pictures people have posted, we all get to see everything 
There's also direct messaging. If you want to ask me an embarrassing or personal question, you can use that and no one else can see it but me. All right, next question, next slide, please. All right, what's next? We're going to email you with a survey and a waiver and um, all these pieces of information that I told you you'll be getting. Ooh, it's getting windy. Uh, we want you to scout and harvest and communicate. We want you to submit your acorns. So submitting your acorns, this is gonna be interesting. So once you've harvested them, you don't, um, they'll be fine in a cool space in a plastic bag for two to three days. It's best to get them into a fridge soon, although I don't recommend you put them in a fridge with your own food, because then, you know, weevils and stuff. So um, we will um, give you information on where they can be dropped off Monday through Friday during, um, between, well, after dark and then, you know, um, anytime during the day, there'll be a cooler available for you to drop off your acorns that Chow will be managing. Also, I think we might consider doing a couple of specific days where we do um, like porch or doorstep pickup during a specific time frame to see if we can facilitate that. So um, keep tabs on your email and communication links for more information. All right, what's next? We got anything else? Chow, did I have any other? No, just a thank you. All right, I'm gonna hit up Q&A and then we'll stay on as long as it takes to answer any more questions. If you have to go, I understand. Um, and if you do have to go right at noon, thank you for being with us, but I hope you can stick around until we finish Q&A and, and don't be a stranger, please reach out. Like all of my contact information is here. If you wanna reach out just to me, use just my email address. If you wanna talk about the project, it's better to hit the acorn harvest email because um, multiple people are monitoring that. Um, my cell phone number is the 5301 on here. Uh, if you call the office number, you won't reach me because I don't go there, but you can leave me messages there anytime. Um, our website has some stuff on it. We're working hard to get everything else up. You can befriend me on Facebook. I'm Corcus Labata. Can you believe that? I'm on Instagram as the Nettie Acorn Girl, and um, you'll see us putting out um, Instagram posts under Acorn Harvesters 2020 in Sack Tree. So please join us. Feel free to post away. All right. Oops. I'm going to start at the top. So earlier, very early, Maggie, on how are the areas for reforestation decided? Yeah, this is a lot of work that I spend a lot of time on this with my uh, restoration program manager. Uh, his name is Lauren O'Rourke. And once those projects get installed, Chow Vu, our tenacious tech wizard, and um, his partner in the field, Ryan Bodis, actually care for those trees after they've been planted. Um, this takes a lot of work. We don't own any land and um, we don't have any management rights. So all of this requires partnerships with public land managers within the Sacramento region. So um, we're always looking for places that are in need of oak woodland reforestation. And we have various ways that we fund this work. I could probably give a whole hour long lecture on that. So I'm not going to today. Um, Janice, you asked about pins. I don't know anything about pins. Um, I can contact or connect you with Stephanie Robinson perhaps who can answer that. I would love for us to have pins. As far as I know, we don't have any pins. Pins would be cool. Um, I think I answered this question about blue oak acorns changing color. They turn on almost purpley, purpley blue, black color. If you can get out to anywhere with blue oak acorns in Folsom, Rockland, or Roseville in the next couple of days, I can guarantee you will find blue oak acorns to look at um, and check out how lovely they are. Yeah, Eric, the leaves on interior live oaks are really cool. And um, we can nerd out about that in private if you want to chat. That would be fun. Um, oh, yeah, so I, I think I did mention the plot. So for submissions, we really would prefer that they're in Ziploc bags. Um, yes, uh, I do often use paper bags in the field when I'm doing my initial harvest before sorting. That's another good way to go because you can recycle them later when they get gross stuff from the field on them or you can wash your cloth bags as well. Um, if you want, um, if anyone needs to talk through any of the harvesting stuff again, um, please just reach out and we'll talk about it. Um, so the acorns that we get, 
we do three, um, we store them and then we do three, three different things with them. So in places where we can, we do direct seeding planting projects as part of our reforestation efforts. And that usually happens between like December and February. Um, in January, we send out acorns to third grade students. And I don't know if this is gonna happen this year because it's really hard to do individually, but we're, we're working on figuring that out right now as part of our seed to seedling program. Um, those students in a normal year grow them in their classroom and then return them to us so that we can use them for reforestation. Um, for the most part, um, schools are not interested in allowing their students to plant oak trees on campus. However, if you were to know of a school or a location where this might be possible, we're always um, willing to look at that and partner with people because we should plant more oak trees in the region just for biodiversity to store more carbon and to make this a more beautiful place. So um, we generally, we don't hand out our seedlings or anything like that. Um, yeah, I could talk about that for a while too. Um, I think I did mention that I am at Johnson Springview Park in Rockland. I'm hiding in the, in the trees. Um, and I will actually post a little map or add it to the email. Or if you really want to come in this weekend, um, you know, hit me up on my phone by voice or text and I'll tell you exactly where to park and where to go. Um, it, I am on the, uh, let's see, I'm on the east end of the park, kind of by the middle school. There's a dirt track. There's the best blue oak grove in, in the region is here in Johnson Springview Park, but is unfortunately also, or fortunately, depending on how much you love disc golf, it is a disc golf course. So it's not a safe place to harvest acorns most of the time um, or to walk and just look at birds. So um, there is, however, a perimeter trail that I am partway through that goes down towards the creek and to some really lovely valley oaks. And on the other side is the old Whitney golf course, which now is open as trails and there's some really amazing oak trees over there. So this is just in general a really good place to come check out if you want to go on a super big oak nerd adventure. And thanks to the city of Rockland for being a great partner for many years to allow us to work here. Um, All right, let's see. And the Amer ARFP had a reforestation program. Um, they did. Um, the locations that they planted were not near any of the places where you'll be able to harvest, especially valley oaks. Um, and none of their trees are old enough yet to really have a problem. I do know where most of their trees are. So Geo Duchess, if you want to talk a little bit more about American River Parkway places that you like to harvest, we can definitely get into that. Uh, let's see. Emily says that she, how long do I spend harvesting? Uh, oh, with kids. I usually go out in the morning and do uh, like nine to noon and make sure I have lunch packed. I definitely don't go all day, especially with two and five year olds. Like even that's maybe pushing it. Um, yeah, yeah, go early, bring lots of snacks. Um, I hope you have fun, take some pictures. Honestly, like the, just the learning and fun aspect of this, if any, if all of you just even go out and look at an oak tree and have fun, our program will have been successful. Um, it's even better if you can help us harvest acorns, but we will get the harvesting done um, even if none of you can help. It's just way more, more fun and way less driving for us if you can help. Uh, the waivers, so, um, the scout leader, so we're sending out waivers to our trained acorn harvesters who you choose to work with later is up to you. Um, so you will get the, that waiver as part of your email. Um, we're, we're working out the kinks at the moment with DocuSign so nobody has to touch anything or go anywhere. But yeah, as far as your um, scouts or other people working with you, um, they're under your control and yeah, keep them safe. Have a lot of fun and reach out if we can help you. Uh, we don't only focus on oaks for reforestation, just for the acorn harvesting program. We plant all of the locally native, uh, native trees in this area. And on a normal year, we would also be doing black walnut harvesting. We'd be doing willow and cottonwood cuttings and a bunch of other um, efforts with our acorn harvesters. But this year we can't. And um, much of that is even more challenging to teach someone to do and then let them loose. So we, we do plant all of our locally native trees as well as a lot of shrubs and other forbs, bulbs, all sorts of great stuff. But for this program, it's all about oaks. 
Oh, Eric, you asked such good questions. The vermiculite in the fridge. So um, the white oak or quercus section oaks, they don't last very long in the fridge. Uh, we even sometimes have trouble with the ones that go in in October and we pull out in January. Um, really the best time to plant an acorn is as soon as it is ripe. Um, however, there's some inconsistencies with that, right? They need to stay wet and they need to stay moist. So if you can take a ripe acorn and you can plant it immediately and make sure it gets supplemental water until it rains in winter, that's the really like the gold standard that would be the best. We do that some where we can. Um, the, uh, the red oak group or the lobate oaks, they're way, way higher in tannins inside the acorn and they will last a lot longer. We've actually successfully germinated two year olds acorns, but that seems to be kind of on the end spectrum. Um, there's also some talk about getting acorns, especially California oak acorn collections into the um, National Germplasm Repository in Fort um, Collins, Colorado, so that we would have seeds. Um, that's a special liquid nitrogen um, cooled facility. And it's the only way that you can actually store something like an acorn long term. So that's pretty cool, huh? Um, the question is, should your bags go in the fridge before you can deliver them? If you have, if you're okay with that and have a reasonable way to do it or have like a second fridge that is the best, um, like I said, they will be okay for two to three days in a cool, dark location. That is not a fridge. Um, don't leave acorns in your car when it gets really hot. Um, that will cook them and they won't grow as well. So um, if, if you're okay putting them in your fridge, that is really the best place for them to be so that they can, we can slow down their metabolism and just have them be like, oh, it's winter, we need to be dark and cold for a while. Um, but like I said, they will be okay if you like have a dark, cool garage or like I have a little pantry. I usually just put mine in the pantry where it's what probably 65 to 68, where I keep my potatoes, put them with your potatoes <laughs> and um, they'll be okay for several days that way. Wow. I think I answered a lot of questions. It's 1210 and we will keep going until you guys are out of questions. If you put chow, if there's any questions in chat, I can't really see chat. So if there's any questions ling lingering in chat that you think I should answer that you can't, why don't you kick them over into Q&A and we'll keep going until you're all done asking questions. Um, we are not currently growing trees for the shade tree program, but we are trying to do that because um, we would provide better quality trees. So that's something that's in talks. If you wanna lean on your um, smud, oh, what do they call them, wards, the leader of your smud ward, um, to suggest that they should be growing, um, they should be ensuring genetic integrity in the trees that they're providing. Um, go ahead. We've definitely been talking about it, especially the last couple of years. So it's in the works. There's a lot of challenges. Um, nursery facilities are hard to run. Um, there's a lot of requirements to make sure they're sanitary and that we're providing high quality materials. Um, so yeah, that's a complicated question, but I really hope that we can at some point soon, maybe even next year. It's possible. I don't see any more questions. All of you who are still here, I really appreciate it. Looks like some people jumped off. Um, I just wanna thank you all for your time again. And um, I hope that you're excited about this project. Keep an eye on your email and we will get you all of the additional information we've talked about today. Um, and reach out if you um, need something, if you wanna go out today, if you're just burning up wanting to get ready and you need more information, reach out. The best way to reach me today is on my cell phone. Um, it was on that last slide, but I'll say it here too. It's area code 530-902-3751. You can call or text me and unless I am like sleeping or, you know, out swimming or something, I will answer and try and get you the info you need so you can keep, keep doing what you're doing. All right. It looks like we're mostly wrapped up. Um, thank you so much for being here. And I look forward to meeting you all in the forest in real time as soon as we can do that. So be safe, reach out when you need help. Thanks for being here this morning. Have a great weekend. Bye. Bye.